and the, the pandemic illustrates it very well. In fact, uh, we wrote this book last year and we actually say it is likely that the world will be affected by a, will suffer a pandemic created by a virus that does not yet exist. We didn't know it was going to exist within three months of writing that down. But it's a good example of what we mean by radical uncertainty, which is you can say that this kind of thing is likely to happen. If you ask what is the probability it will, that it will break out from a virus in Wuhan in China in 2019, you can't attach a probability or any kind of quantifiable estimate to that. And that's the thesis which we we argue and talk about how instead of pretending to know things about the future which we don't uh, you should construct strategies and whether you're talking about business strategies or retirement planning which are robust and resilient to events you can't predict and actually if people had taken that on board uh, this crisis might have been handled a great deal better and more effectively than it has been. My money. Money. I get money from you. Money in the bank. Young money. Money, 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 money. It's a rich man's world. I began my career as, a, um, as an academic at Oxford University. Um, I taught there for 10 years. Then I went and basically set up a, a think tank in the UK called the Institute for Fiscal Studies, uh, which established and has maintained a, a reputation for pretty vigorous independence. Uh, after a few years of that, I realized that basically what I was good at was taking fairly complicated economic ideas and putting them across to uh, a general audience in a fairly comprehensible way and that led me to a variety of things firstly I set up an economic consulting business which I ran for 10 years and which grew very rapidly um, and I moved to London Business School I became a professor there and taught there for 10 years uh, but actually the consulting business grew very rapidly until running it became essentially a full-time job but after doing that for a bit i sold out of that went back to oxford university for a bit to help establish a business school there uh, which was in some ways an exciting thing to do in other ways the most frustrating years of my life uh, trying to um, uh, get things done in an institution that has been going for 500 years and accumulated a lot of barnacles along the way. Uh, after a bit, I got fed up with that. And since then, I've basically focused on writing and doing pretty much what I like uh, with a uh, background having sold out of a consultancy that means I basically don't have to do things I don't want to do, which is to be in. Well, we need more John Cage, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, it's all interconnected today, John, and, and uh, I, I just, I want to give an example because I was reading the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times last week, I can't remember what it was, and there was a, um, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a, uh, uh, there was a offshore uh, drilling contractor, Valaris, PLC, you ever heard of them? No, I haven't. Okay, it's the largest oil drilling company in the world, all right? And and I said to myself, holy moly, it's it's headquartered in London, it's listed in, in, in London. They filed bankruptcy last week or the week before, or administration as you say in the UK. <laughs> but they filed bankruptcy, John, in Houston, Texas, and the major shareholders were um, uh, Luminous Management, Management Company, uh, BlackRock, and Vanguard, and it's just it's just a pure example of other people's money. And here's so here's the mate, the largest oil driller in the world, headquartered in London, all right, files bankruptcy in Houston, but the largest asset owners of the company are uh, Vanguard, BlackRock, and Lu uh, Luminous Management, 
but you're using all of the people's money yeah. and no and no one knows but this is kind of common isn't it yeah. no i mean the chain of intermediation we now have is far too long uh, and this absence of direct connection between the people whose money it is and where it's where it's being invested it's i you know it's just there there is no and the funny thing john if you go on yahoo like you can in the us you can you can pull up a, like a listed stock or whatever whether it be in london or us market and you can see it's at other people's money but no one really knows am i correct or is it the same way in the uk as it is here um yeah in fact in in the UK, it's, it's, there are some aspects that are worse because we're the kind of centre for semi-respectable shell companies. <laughs> uh, you know, basically, if you're a corrupt dictator <laughs> who wants to hide your money, this is the place you come, London's the place you come to do it. And there are plenty of people in London who are making a good living of explaining uh, just how you do it a modest part of the take. And, and then they have them down in the uh, the Caymans or uh, or the uh, British Virgin Islands. The, the restroom down there or you know, offshore. That's right. So it goes through these, uh, the kind of shameful relic of British colonialism, that these tiny offshore centres that we can no longer be bothered paying for instead support themselves through um, through facilitating this kind of activity it's yeah so it's it's really it's not it's it's really but what, what uh, right now with there's so many layers of intermediate uh, in, intermediaries okay but the average person really can't figure it out yeah uh, no we're right I mean the industry a large part of the industry is surviving on uh, what you describe as the the control illusion that people um, uh, think by making uh, act, by get, think people think that by engaging in transactions they're increasing the value of their assets and typically overall they're reducing them and, and the amount by which they are reducing them is what pays for the bloated financial sector we have you know it's Wall Street it could be uh the city of Linder, or whether it's the same in Toronto, Bay Street, it's all pretty much the same. Um, and then you had another, here's another passage that says, we all chase the dream, but when by excess, when taken to excess by individuals or in crowds, the chasing of dreams becomes madness. And chasing the dream with other people's money is at best irresponsible and often fraudulent. Gambling is everywhere, closely regulated because of organization of gambling is an activity attractive to fraudsters and crooks because gambling leads people to make bad decisions which can destroy their finances and their lives and damage their friends and their families because uncontrolled gambling will increase society's exposure to risk. And so it is with wage generating in the financial markets. And so you've kind of painted this picture in other people's money that it's, the markets have become an, like an uncontrolled casino. Yeah, well it's um, very nearly a century since Keynes wrote that when the allocation of capital is the byproduct of the activities of this, a casino, the job is not likely to be well done. And uh, I, he could never have envisaged the volume of trading in financial markets which we now have. One of, and one of the things which you, you did a very good job in this book is that, could you explain the state of regulatory capture because it's pretty much the same in the UK as the US how these there the Wall Street or the city of London are seem to be four or five steps ahead of you know regulators how does that work now John yeah um, regulatory capture is the general term for the world in which um, a regulator in effect comes to promote the interests of the industry rather than the interests of the, the users of the industry's services. And it's something that's been seen right across the board in, in regulation. It goes back, actually, to the beginnings of um, transportation regulation in the U.S. way back in the late 19th century. Yeah. Uh, there's a famous exchange in which um, uh, the railroads are trying to lobby against regulation. And... Uh, 
uh, rather shrewd advisor, legal advisor to them says, don't bother, you will be able to turn it to your <laughs> It's pretty much exactly what happened. So that um, uh, only a very few years later, the regulation of railroads had in effect become a cartel operating on behalf of railroads. And that um, the airline industry for a long time was another example of the same phenomenon. So regulatory capture is a very general observation. Now, interestingly, in different countries, it happens in different ways. In the US, in the US, it's relatively corrupt, actually, that um, the regulator identifies directly with the industry that is being regulated. And there's a revolving door of people going in and out of regulation and the firms that are being regulated and very powerful and expense costly lobbying activities uh, taking place in Washington. The UK is kind of, as in some other respects, less crude. But Ed Turner, uh, who was um, head of the British Financial Regulatory Authority for a bit, described it as intellectual capture. <laughs> The, the, the regulator just comes to see things in the same way. I, you know, I, well, it, I, I'm laughing because you, you're speaking the truth, and uh, and, and I get it. Um, and this has also created, I, I call it a, it's, I don't know who come, came up with this, you probably know the economist. It's really come up to a system, an economic system, John, of, of rent-seeking. Uh, uh, rent, the rentier society, you mentioned going to France prior, we were talking about is, the rent to your society with our financial assets. Does that make sense? We're kind of evolving to that? Yeah. Uh... Rent seeking is the business, or rent seeking is the business of lobbying to get um, advantages over your competitors or advantages for your industry as a whole. And now, well, the largest centres in the world for that today are Washington and Brussels, and uh, the amount of money. Right, if one looks, for example, probably the worst examples in the U.S. Uh, are financial services and healthcare, and the extent to which legislation in these areas is actually written by um, uh, by lobbyists is extraordinary. And there are other industries that work in a depressingly similar way. Um, farming would be another one, which is in most advanced countries, very largely dependent on the, the political success of the lobbyists. Rent seeking, so what I've seen, John, and what I've found that most of the systems, I mean, they may have different names, but they're kind of the same, uh, like the mutual fund industry. The, the mutual fund industry in the U.S. is the biggest in the world, but the U.K. is the second largest, I guess, and then I think Canada may be third. Um, uh, but they're all pretty similar. They may have different names, um, but they, but they uh, uh, and I, I give a great example of regulatory capture. Um, uh, you're obviously familiar with the leverage buy up private equity industry, okay? <laughs> um, and I've been doing a lot of research on this stuff, and um, it's, it's, it's very alarming, particularly during this COVID period, John, um, all the bankruptcies. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, well, most of them, not a lot of them, are, are coming from um, uh, the leveraged buy it industry or private equity. Is it? But what, what, what they just approved, the Department of Labor approved in, in the month of June, is the inclusion of private equity as an investment choice into people's retirement accounts. Now, to me, this is insane. That, some of these private equity funds are like giving a, a six year old child a circular saw. I mean, I mean is, is, <laughs> I mean, does this make sense to you, John? I mean, I mean, what people, uh, most people don't want to spend a lot of time on their investments. They would just want to find people they can trust. And half a century ago, uh, you know, banking might have been, well, well, when banking was the rather boring business uh, it once was, uh, people felt they could go into uh banks at least and get financial advice which was reasonably disinterested and aimed to help them and that has really long ago gone in the pursuit of more and more commissions transactions activity 
and the like. And what we need one way or another is, is to try and get back to that. It's not actually loads more regulation. It's actually people internalizing, taking on board themselves the values that regulation ought to be trying to, to inculcate. You know, above all, putting clients' interests before your own. Yeah, so let's see, I'm an advisor, but I have a fiduciary responsibility to look up my interest in my clients first. But yeah. if I represent a, a bank or a broker dealer, they represent the house. And, um, you know, I, I take this really, um, uh, I think it's, it's a gift to be given this privilege, but I just see it in the markets now, it's crazy. It's just like um, gambling with other people's money. Um, and you know the amount, the amount of lobbying that has been, has gone <clears> to prevent obligations being imposed on US financial advisors. And, and what they're doing, unfortunately, is that they're wiping out, it's, it's making it very difficult for the smaller guy to survive because of the, because of the complexity. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, that's that's because of the, the giant asset managers, they, they can spend all they want. Yeah. I mean, what, one of the little notice features of regulation is the extent to which it favors large firms over small. <laughs> but that these large firms can afford to do the lobbying, and secondly, because the costs of employing a compliance department and the like um, can be spread over many more activities and customers in a large firm than they can in a small. Are basic economies of scale in dealing with regulation. One of the things which I, I think and I get this really from the uh, I think maybe from Greedy's Dead book, but um, to me it seems that. Um, and I think this is from your uh, Greed is Dead book, which is we'll get into in a bit, but <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, the financial companies saying they're the great allocators of capital, um, uh, but it seems to me that they're more successful at extracting capital out of the companies, their, their target companies, if you will, than, than, um, than investing capital. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, people don't understand that it's a long time since equity markets were a way in which companies raised uh, raised capital for investment. Um, nowadays, um, in Britain and the United States, more money is taken out of the stock market through share buy buybacks uh, and acquisitions for cash than is raised in IPOs and rights issues. So that the stock market today is a means of taking money out of the corporate sector, not a means of putting it in. And that's not entirely bad because no. um, you're providing liquidity for early stage investors and the like. But it's not the way people, uh, either in the industry or outside it, think about the way in which in which markets work. Yeah, because, uh, matter of fact, next week, um, um, the gentleman, the foremost researcher of uh, uh, buybacks, uh, hang on, I, I, I'm just trying to hang on one second, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, let's see, William Lozonic. Yes. I'm going to have him, I'm interviewing him next week, but he, he's kind of the expert on buybacks, because in the U.S., John, it, there's been, 5.3 trillion uh, of uh, stock buybacks over the past decade. I mean, I, to me, it's just, and that's essentially benefiting the insiders. I mean, I mean, a lot of it is that uh, since management remuneration, not yeah. much more related to stock values, uh, companies more and more preferred to buy back shares rather than pay out dividends. So, yeah, but there really has been, now, like I have a small business, so when I, I reinvest a lot of my money in equipment and IT and things like that, but it seems to be just really taking the money off the table. And then, um, which I couldn't believe is that the, you don't have it as great, but you have the dividend recap, recapitalizations, if you will, um, uh, in the UK and the US, where they lever up a company and extract money with essentially additional debt? Well, that's back to what you were describing earlier in terms of the leverage private equity buyout. And in truth, some of the pri private equity can either be very good or very bad. It can be a vehicle, and sometimes is, 
for long-term patient investment in early stage companies. Or it can be what it often, much too often is, is gearing companies up to massage the earnings for two or three years and then sell it on or float it back on public markets. Now, another question I have, John, you're, you're pretty high up in the UK economic uh, expertise level. Has anyone kind of given you, because uh, you wrote a book with Mervyn King, am I correct? Yeah, that's um, right, radical. Right you know, so um, have you got any blowback from speaking the truth to people? Oh, yeah, but, but, but you've got a lot of positive reactions as well. Um, I don't get invited to give speeches at Goldman Sachs conference. <laughs> I, can't, I can't live without that. But uh, in, Mer in Mervyn King, what was the book you do with Mervyn King about? Uh, it's, 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 it's Radical Uncertainty. Uh, radical Uncertainty. So, and, uh, and I haven't read that one, but that was about this all the fragility of the markets now, or is that? It's not particularly about markets it's a much more general set of arguments uh, that says that the scope of probabilistic reasoning has been greatly exaggerated and people have built models round about believing that you can describe uncertainty probabilistically uh, and actually the importance of that is that most of the finance theory that gets taught in uh, business schools and CFA courses, and much of what is called modern rational expectations, macroeconomics, is based on the belief that you can describe uncertainty in that sort of way. And we argue it at some length and uh, with many examples in this book that that just can't be done. I would agree with you. I call it, I keep it simple. It's like these guys are trying to play God. We don't know what interest rates are going to be. We don't know where the stock market's going to go. We don't know if we're dying and disabled. We just don't know. I don't know what I'm having for lunch today, John. Never mind what's going to happen uh, next week. So these, all these models, it, it's almost like they're they're playing God. They're trying to predict the future. Yeah, or uh, simply making up numbers uh, <laughs> that uh, you construct yourself or yourself a spreadsheet uh, <laughs> that would give you the answer to a question. And then you discover you don't know what goes in cells <laughs> of that spreadsheet. So you make all these numbers up. And uh, if you describe that to, as it were, the man, in, man or woman in the street, uh, it's obviously insane as it is. But there's a whole industry of doing that. And what I've just described applies to actuarial modeling of pension funds at one end or we we talk a, a, a little bit about some length about uh, the UK model which is used for appraising transport projects so if you want to and there's a set of numbers prescribed for that so if you want to know how many passengers there will be in a car on average on a Friday afternoon in 2036, <laughs> and so on. Uh, if you want to know what Britain's growth rate will be in 2080, you can get the answer to two decimal places. All these answers are just made up to enable people to uh, use these spreadsheet models. You know, John, this is, you know, I, I, I laugh about this because I, I, th I think I said in one of my first books, I I'll send you, I wrote a book on target date funds, which are mutual funds. Do you have the same thing in the UK where like a specific like retirement date, like 2030 or 40s? Oh. Is it, you have those over there, right? Yep. To me, that's just, that's like a, it's like a legal chimera. I mean, it's just, we don't know. I mean, look, look, look how much this pandemic has changed things in the world. So this is, the whole idea that we can come up with some algorithm to predict the future and have a proper management of bonds or, or stocks is, is, is kind of silly. So you have the same thing in the UK, huh? Yeah. Uh, and the, the pandemic illustrates it very well. In fact, uh, we wrote this book last year and we actually say it is likely that the world will be affected by a, will suffer a pandemic created by a virus that does not yet exist.
we didn't know it was going to exist within three months of writing that down. But it's a good example of what we mean by radical uncertainty, which is you can say that this kind of thing is likely to happen. If you ask what is the probability it will, that it will break out from a virus in Wuhan in China in 2019, you can't attach a probability or any kind of quantifiable estimate to that. And that's the thesis which we we argue and talk about how instead of pretending to know things about the future, which we don't, uh, you should construct strategies and whether you're talking about business strategies or retirement planning, which are robust and resilient to events you can't predict. And actually, if people had taken that on board, uh, this crisis might have been handled a great deal better and more effectively than it has been. I have to read the book then, but that's, you're just essentially saying you can't predict the future, but it's, the systems are saying, that, you know, like these target date funds or the whole idea of diversification, you can diversify away risk. Well, we knew in the last financial crisis, if you take a bunch of crappy mortgages and you make a huge pool of them, it doesn't, they think the whole diversification thing has just been taken, it's on steroids. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense, but it's, this is, everyone's being told. This. Well, well but, um, don't knock diversification because that, that was simply illusory diversification. Uh, you know, that a whole load of crappy mortgages were a whole load of crappy mortgages. <laughs> a triple A security. And it's uh, rather sobering that it took the financial crisis for people to discover that. But I don't know, but, but people don't seem to, memories are short, am I correct? I mean, it didn't seem. Yeah, so um, go back to that mistake. Um, when well, people look at, at historical patterns, in which the main reason people defaulted on mortgages was something that had gone wrong in their individual lives. Uh, you know, they'd got ill or um, marriage or relationships had broken down or whatever. And these things uh, were uncorrelated with each other. You just got a few of these events happening every year. Uh, what created the crisis, of course, was that uh, uh, when the housing market stalled, uh, loads of people found themselves struggling with their mortgages. So that what had seemed to provide diversification in the end didn't. But that's just a matter of actually understanding what is going on here. Because back to the, uh, the bogus quantification issue, um, they, people worked on the basis of historic data sets that didn't describe the current reality. Uh, there's no irony in that, in that uh, you develop models to protect yourself against your bank going bust, you necessarily drawn from a period when your bank didn't go bust, otherwise you wouldn't have the data. Yeah, so, um... So and I would say, and just being kind of an old Yankee, is that we've kind of thrown a lot of common sense out the window, John. Does that make any sense to? Um... Yeah, in that kind of Yankee common sense, it's Mark Twain. The problem isn't so much what people don't know as what they do know that ain't. <laughs> yeah, because because um, <clears throat> uh, what I've also seen, John, and I, this is just uh, my opinion, and. Um, so we've seen active management has always been a disaster in the U.S. and the U.K. And there's, there's been scandals, and I think um, the uh, the Financial Conduct Authority, uh, which is your main regulator, um, you know, in 2016 found out, you know, that the, there's 8, 1,800 fund managers in the U.K. <clears throat> managing some 8.6 trillion, and. Um, and you know, and top ten, top ten managers control forty-seven percent of the assets. Um, and um, and uh, the, uh, over the all the equity funds which existed in two thousand six, over half of them been closed down. And um, and and most people didn't know about the um, the charge on the investment products. Um, and so he, and then recently, I saw something in the Financial Times that but there was problems that, with the very I, it was a big money manager in the UK. Um, 
but but people, my point is, people really don't know what's going on, do they? I mean, in a whole, the regular guy in the street. Yeah. Uh, and to be fair, regulators have made quite serious attempts to get um, get a standardized measure of charges across to people. But it has actually proved almost impossible to get a, a, a meaningful measure of charges that you can communicate to people. Again, it's what people, what people need is not loads more information that's very difficult for them to understand. It's actually to be able to find people that they can trust. Yeah. And that's what, um, uh, what has so much, so much gone from the financial sector in the last few decades. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think you really trust because, you know, I have people call me from around the country and saying that um, indexing is the only way to go. Um, uh, and matter of fact, it, I didn't realize this, but and uh, I found this in the Financial Times that, that BlackRock and Vanguard, which are huge indexers in the U.S., have become huge uh, indexers in the U.K. with their, uh, there's a FTSE U.K., uh, um, uh, which is gathering a lot of assets. But a lot of these, John, and, um, I'm always saying we should have more active management because these passive funds are turned into, I call them communists or communist, communist investments or passive pigeons. I don't know if that's kind of harsh, but that's there's no accountability with passive investments. Um, I mean, what we need is active and active management that really is active and active. In my book, means engagement with and understanding what is actually going on in companies. It's not selling Shell to buy BP and then reversing the trade. <laughs> um, it's always, you know, but matter of fact, you call it the edge. And you got this from uh, other people's money. You said, the goose that lays the golden eggs has been considered the most valuable position, but even more probable is the privilege of taking the golden eggs laid by someone else's goose. The investment bankers and the associates now that privilege. They control this through other people's money. Louis Brandeis, other people's money. That was in your, in your book, Other People's Money. So, yeah. so um, now, one question which I've done, and I'd have to share this with you at some point, is that uh, for people, because a lot of people come to me with the retirement funds, how do I have a pension? Because I know, what do they call them? Pension schemes in the UK? Yeah. Is, that, is that what you call them? Schemes? I always get a kick of that. And we call them defined benefit pensions here. Uh, right. We, we, we use the same terminology in the UK as well. But in the UK, um, defined benefit schemes are virtually dead outside the public sector now. Yeah, and the same thing with the US. So there's one other thing which I've done the research is, um, and uh, thank God for the internet, but I found a lot of these major uh, companies um, from uh, uh, it's, uh, are using life insurance annuity products, um, you know, to de-risk, essentially to to uh, trans risk transfer to uh, to third parties. Uh, uh, examples include you know, British Telecom, British Airways, General Motors, Lloyd's Banking, Merchant Navy Pension Plan, Rolls Royce, FedEx, HSBC, ICI Pension. I there's two three hundred more that I can name, but they're really they're, so. There is kind of a, um, a certain amount of safety with the insurance company because, because they're not levered up like the banks. No, but the insurance industry doesn't really have the capacity to absorb all that. I mean, they people, don't. That's you're right. And people have talked about well, British Airways as actually being really being an investment company with a small airline. <laughs> <laughs> that's the same about General Motors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, no. That, that that's a problem of capacity no. because they can't. They they can't. Um, uh, the uh, there's a problem of capacity, but it does seem to be a more um, risk transfer than putting more into, into the market. Um, greed is dead. I want to talk about that because that's um, and um, it's the book. It's a great book. It is. It's kind of about the rise of technology, the complete financialization, financialization of the UK and the US. Uh, can you explain that to our viewers? Um, the real theme of greed is dead 
is that the last half century we've had a heavily individualistic approach to the world uh, which has really denied a role for agencies other than the individual and the state and actually we do things together through communities that the reason our economies are so productive is that people work together cooperatively in businesses uh, and the reason people uh, what gives people fulfilling lives is being parts of the communities of yeah. place in which they operate and what has um, really transformed politics in both Britain and the US and not in our judgment in a good way is the destruction of these communities of work and communities of place so the corporations are represented as people each trying to line their own pocket and communities of place have been hollowed out uh, particularly as uh, able people in provincial areas have left to go to higher education elsewhere and as the manufacturing industry which employed created communities of not very skilled work workers who uh, operated together um, have been um, have been hollowed out you have many examples of that in the US in the book we focus on two particular examples in the UK one of which is Don Valley which used to be a mining community uh, that mining has gone as it basically no more coal mining in the UK anymore uh, and Stoke-on-Trent which used to be uh, really the ceramic center of Europe yeah. to some degree of the world and that ceramic industry and uh, there are still some head offices of companies there uh, but that has now gone to the Far East production uh, and the, the, the mines have closed and the main activity that happens in in Don Valley now is logistics warehouses for people uh, who deliver your product Amazon products and things like that and even worse than Stoke and Trent uh, the the largest the largest employer in Stoke on Trent is now one of the firms that's engaged in online gambling or yeah. uh, quite an online gambling platform uh, so people uh, people aren't unemployed or even that poor in these areas but the kind of communities that were around about these activities have gone and they don't provide the kind of you know people talk about the, the kind of dignity of labor which is not a term I like uh, but actually there was a kind of pride in a mining community even though mining was a horrible wasn't yeah. a horrible job I remember. and similarly and rather rather more clearly in making what people thought was the best ceramics in the world and that is gone you can't feel quite the same way about say, <laughs> foolish punters <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, punters better. That's the English for be gambling, you know. And that's, um, I, I mean, but if you look, who is the? Uh, and I've been doing the research, but a lot of these these gambling firms, the biggest, John, was there was Gala Corral. That's in the UK. Um, that was a big one. Am I correct? That was huge. And th that ended up in administration or bankruptcy. Getting when there was UK private equity firms and. U.S. private equity firms, and then the, the biggest one was Season Entertainment in, in the U.S., done by Apollo and Texas Pacific Group, they went bankrupt too. So it's just, I don't know, it's just, this, this gambling has just been turned... Yeah, although that's a slightly different story. It's um, of the uh, endless taking what are potentially viable businesses and putting in more leverage than the businesses can take uh, and uh, uh, one of the big issues over the couple of years of this coronavirus, coronavirus crisis uh, will be seeing how many of these businesses that are viable in the long run can survive the kind of pressures go through. I've, I've been giving a little attention to 
uh, one of the industries that has really suffered uh, from all of this. Uh, it's the UK budget hotel industry, the, the kind of roadside uh, chains that operate things like your motels, really. Yeah. Travel Lodge is one of them. Is Travel Lodge, Travel Lodge is one. The two big ones in the UK are Travel Lodge and Premier Inns. And Travel Lodge is leveraged up to the hilt and owned by Goldman and a consortium of private equity. Renaissance, yeah, it's a second leverage buyer on that one, yeah. And, um, whereas Premier Inns is actually a public company, listed company, that made a rights issue in the course of the summer, essentially to recoup the losses which they'd made from coronavirus. And it's... Um, and it will continue as a viable entity. Oh, what, happen, what happens to um, uh, Travelodge it has proved more interesting, actually, that they tried uh, going into administra or threatening administration, the kind we were talking about earlier, in order to try and impose rent reductions on the people who own their, actually own their hotels, because very few of the hotels Travelodge operate are actually owned by that itself highly leveraged business. Uh, but in the end, there was a, a, a revolt by the, by the owners of the property against Travelodge. And it looks as though Travelodge may now be picked up by one of the large international French hotel chains. Uh, because it, it's a business that is, is perfectly viable in the long run, uh, but it's going to be a big loser, money loser in 2020 and 2021. And of course, there are a lot of businesses like that, particularly in the travel and hospitality sector, that we're going to want as much in 2025 as we did in 2015, but which we don't much, much want in 2020. So, so um, this has been great. So what's the solution, John? I mean, um, you know, we, we're kind of on the same page here. Getting back to community, I mean, I... I yeah. uh, and community I agree more. you to the heart of what I would mean by responsible business, uh, which is an agenda that gets distracted, I think, into people talking about carbon emissions and, uh, you know, what proportion of women you have on your board. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's actually really about uh, building businesses which understand you make profits in the long run by serving customers and looking after your employees. And that's what we need to get back to people about thinking about business in this sort of way. He counted on America to be passive. He counted wrong.